Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Great to see we have so many people popping in from all over the world to see the one, the only, Mr. Mark Randolph. Mark, how are you today? Well, thanks, Dan. Glad to be here and welcome to everybody who's uh, tuning in as we speak. So as you all know, uh, Mark is the co-founder of Netflix, the founding CEO of Netflix, and uh, by the look of the color of his sweatshirt, um, <laughs> just escaped from prison uh, or is picking up uh, garbage on the side of the road. What is it, Mark? Uh, I have a pumpkin fetish. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, we've got uh, lots of people here and you guys are lucky because not only is Mark here, this is a primo snow day for him. So he is raring to hit the mountains, but he's sacrificing that for you. Yeah, don't don't rub it in. I'm looking out my window behind the camera at the uh, all the snow out there. But <laughs> but listen, I got my priorities are straight, and helping entrepreneurs is certainly priority number one. Excellent, excellent. Well, and if uh, you know, as we watch and as you hear from this man, if you want to see more of him, there's a million ways to do it. But one that we're really excited about is Entrepreneur TV which you can all see on Sling TV or on entrepreneur.com slash TV. Uh, he, episodes of Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. Mark is the anchor of that show. You can learn so much watching and hearing from him. So we encourage you all to tune in. But we've got him live. So, Mark, what do you say? Should we get right to it? Let's bring it on, Dan. All right. Well, uh, we got a lot of questions that were sent in uh, before, but as always, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. We will get to as many as possible. This one came in from Jacob earlier today, and uh, I think it's a good way to start because people talk about, you know, you're starting your business, chase your passion. What's your passion? How do you combine your passion with entrepreneurship and why is that so important? Jacob asks. Uh Let's take the second part first. Um, the reason it, it's great if you can combine your passion with uh, your day job is that entrepreneurship is hard. I mean, despite what you see in the movies and what you see on TV and despite what you see on Elevator Pitch, uh, there's a lot of grunt work that goes into this. There's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of plugging away for days, weeks, and months without seeing a lot of progress. Um, and you have to be motivated by something deeper than that. And the most powerful motivation is this fascination with a subject. In other words, that you consider yourself lucky. You get to spend every day dealing with this thing that you are passionate about. Um, and in my case, I mean, I, Netflix was, you know, startup number, uh, number six, I guess it was. And my passion was not necessarily the domain. It isn't like... I was passionate about movies. I was a totally normal movie watcher. Just like my passion for the startup before that was not quality assurance software. No, my passion was entrepreneurship. My passion was, I loved that process of solving really cool puzzles, of always asking myself, why, why is it done that way? There must be a better way. So I was lucky that way. But your passion might be different. Your passion might be, in fact, Gosh, I've always loved stamps. And if you can figure out a company that has something to do with stamps, God, you get to do the thing you love every single day. And hopefully you have something you have a tremendous insight into. You understand, I don't know how I got going down the path of using stamps as an example, but let's go with it. <laughs> um, you know, you know what it feels like to be a stamp collector. You know how unbelievably exciting it is when you discover some weird misprint of the price, which most of the world couldn't give a shit about, but you go, <laughs> stamp collectors love this stuff. And you understand that. And you see the problems. 
You go, there's no transparency. There's no pricing consistency. And that's where it comes from, is all of a sudden you take this thing you loved and you recognize there's got to be a better way. There's this thing that I'm frustrated about. Maybe I'm the person to solve it. Um, you know, you're lucky if it happens. I'm not sure how you can force it. Um, but if it happens, um, you're a lucky person indeed. That's great. That's great. And I know you say stamp nerds, but I know you're really into stamps. In fact, you have a tattoo of your favorite stamp. Uh, I won't say where, but um, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times what we write about and what we talk about is this word success. And uh, someone I've written in, I thought it was a good question, which is, you know, you've had, you know, by all measures, success. But how do you define success, especially when you're starting something new? Um, like what means success to you? Yeah, that's a complicated question. And I think it screws a lot of people up. You know, I alluded in that previous answer to the fact that, you know, entrepreneurship has been glorified, that there are TV shows about it, you know, that there is movies about it, that it gets a lot of popular press, that some of our heroes are like, you know, Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or an anti-hero, an Elon Musk, there are entrepreneurs. And wow, that didn't happen 30 years ago. And what it makes people think is they're pursuing success when it's measured as economic success. They, they've made billions of dollars. Or it's fame and success. Uh, and the problem with measuring success that way is it's extremely unlikely that you're going to get it. Uh, and it, it, I, the, the, the parallel I've often used when I'm talking about this is like people who want to be actors or actresses. And if the reason that they want to do that is because they want to be successful, which means being famous, which means being rich, which means being on the, you know, this night show, uh, not going to happen. You know, it happens to almost to a tiny, tiny fraction of people. And it's the same thing with entrepreneurship. So I've often said you, you need to define success differently. And again, you can't force it, but that for me, success was never that. For me, success was always defined as being able to do the things that you love doing and being good at them. And if you could spend your day doing something you love and that you're good at, I can't imagine a more successful business life um, than that. Uh, and for me, that's kind of been this motivator is that I pat myself on the back every single day saying, I got to do the thing I love to do most of my life. And I was good at it. Um, and it's interesting because I think I did have the kind of success. That's the common definition. I did start, you know, two very big companies. I did make a lot of money at it. You know, I do have a really cushy lifestyle because of that. But it's never the reason I did it. And I think the reason I had that success is because I wasn't chasing it. It's because I was chasing the other success that I was willing to keep coming. I liked coming to work every day, no matter how hard it was. I loved coming in and figuring out, oh, my God, things are disastrous. How am I going to turn this around? And I think that's what leads to the other success. But listen, Dan, you know me. I can't miss this opportunity to say what the real definition of success is for me. And I've, this is not the first time I've said it, but I have to lay it out, is that I, I mentioned Netflix was my, I guess, my fifth startup. And I've had a couple of really big su economic successes. I've had a bunch of IPOs. I'm really, really, really fortunate. But what I'm proudest of and what the real success is, is that I've managed to make all that stuff happen and stay married to the same woman for 33 years now. Uh, I had 37. Oh, she'll kill me. Somewhere in the thirties. Um, that marriage just ended, Mark. I have, <laughs> I have these three kids that, and I was just an hour ago going, God, it's so fun hanging out with them. Yeah. And the fact that I could start all those companies and still have those relationships with my uh, wife, with my kids that I can still go out and go skiing. Yeah. Man, that, that is success. That's awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. A belated uh, Valentine's gift to all of us. That's, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, uh, you know, uh, who's watching Abigail uh, asks a question. It's kind of like the opposite of what you said, which is, you know, you, you felt this like pride and 
patting yourself on the back sometimes like this is awesome i get to jump in but what about that old uh, imposter syndrome that so many people tend to feel when they are doing that thing and they're all of a sudden like wait am i qualified to do this how, how do you uh, advise people to kind of overcome that uh, I guess the only way to overcome it is to recognize you're not the only person who has it. That I, I think it's pretty, I genuinely think it's pretty universal. And I, I'll go out on a limb here. I think there's something wrong with you if you don't have it. <laughs> if you think, man, I've got this nailed. I am so qualified. You're missing something. <laughs> We've all got, got these, these, these flaws. Um, and, it's really healthy, I think, to question yourself. The thing you can't do is let that concern stop you. You can't go, I'm not qualified to do this, and so I won't. You got to go, oh, boy, I have no idea what's going to happen. And gosh, it, almost always you go, oh, wasn't anything. It's the exact same. I, you know, I do a lot of public speaking. And I, 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 at this point in my career, I get pretty big audiences. You know, I'll have 4,000 people or 6,000 people. And I'm pretty good at it. But every single time backstage, I'm scared. I'm nervous. I go, I'm going to forget something. I'm going to screw this up. But the other part of my head is saying, um, remember, Mark, that as soon as you get out there, you won't be scared anymore. And that allows me to have the confidence. If I'm scared, I'm going to do it anyway because I know I won't be scared once I start. And imposter syndrome is the same way. You go, he's got to force your way through it. If it's any consolation, I definitely have it. I was talking to my son just yesterday about how I have this element of imposter syndrome, about this project that I'm taking on. I'm going, is this going to work? And I go, I'm not going to stop me. And it makes me think um, this. A little healthy bit of paranoia is, a, I think, a critical ingredient for any entrepreneur. You should always be wondering what could go wrong and be thinking, well, how will I react when it does? And having a little bit of paranoia about your own abilities, I think it's healthy. So if you figure out how to get rid of it entirely, uh, let me know. I could benefit from that too. <laughs> That's great. And, you know, just building off of that too, you always hear about athletes and performers, you know, that before they step on stage, they, they want to feel those nerves because that brings that energy to them. So uh, like learning to use that as a superpower, I think is a great thing. Um, we got a, a pretty cool question from uh, Priya uh, earlier. Um, so apart from solving a real user problem, she asks, what are some of the other top factors you should consider before starting a company? Uh, so I'm glad you brought up the, the, I mean, you got to solve a problem. You've got to solve a problem for a customer because otherwise you fall into this terrible trap of you become a idea in search of a problem rather than a problem in search of a solution. Uh, and it's much, much better to be a problem or solution. But you know that, and you're saying, what else is there? Um, the next question is, um, do a lot of people have that problem? Because that'll help you decide what scale um, does this have the potential to be? Uh, I can have a problem which only three people have. And yeah, that might be fun. But it may not support the aspirations that you have for um, your business. So a lot of people have it. Um, do I, meaning you, does one, is this a good match between my abilities and what it would take to solve this problem for this customer? So you might go, wow, it looks like there is room for a, uh, MRI machine, which costs about 25% of what the current ones do using this tech new magnet, blah, 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 blah I don't know, but Great, great idea. Yeah, a lot of people want it? Absolutely. But big lucrative market? Absolutely. But do you know the first thing about what it would take to build a hardware product, which is going to take two or three years just to get to the beta version of? That's another criteria. Is this a good match for my abilities and the scale of where I am um, entrepreneur? And then, of course, the big one, going back to a question that just got asked a little bit ago, does this interest me? Is this something that I'm willing to allocate uh, a bunch of my my life to? So those are a lot of the things that would be going um, through my mind. And then the last one is, like, I guess, economically, um, are you willing to lock yourself into this? How long do you think this will take before you know if it's going to resonate or not? Uh, 
if you have a cool idea for something which is entirely digital, which can be done with a website, well, you'll find out really quickly. Um, and so you can take some chances where you may evaluate it and say, I'm built like one of the companies I was working with a while ago was building a robotic dishwasher. Uh, and we knew it was going to be several years before we could even get a product in front of a customer. And do we have the patience and the time and the economic appetite for that? Um, that's great. And so we mentioned uh, entrepreneur elevator pitch. You get pitched all the time and you got a pitch that just came in from uh, Okavang. Mark, can I get $10,000? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, there, there, there you go. No. I mean, there are, I, I guess the better answer is maybe, but highly unlikely. <laughs> or if for all the people out there who are wondering, you know, what's a good, what's the elements of a good pitch? That's not, not one. Make the <laughs> ask. Sure. Are, but you need a few precursors to that. Right. First. <laughs> so what, what is, um, you know, a, a cocktail party or elevator, like a true elevator pitch or, you know, if you do see someone that you think like, oh, this is my shot to, to get this idea in front of this person. Uh, I don't know if you welcome that kind of thing, but if you did, what, how would you say to cold approach somebody? So the first and most important thing to recognize about that is that you're not trying to get the investment when you do that. Uh, and, and that goes, to, listen, cocktail party is a great analogy for this. Uh, you certainly are not trying to get someone to write you a check on the spot at the uh, cocktail party. But that exact same principle applies to any way you're approaching someone. Your objective is not to get the investment with that first pitch. It's to get them intrigued enough to say, oh, let, let's talk some more about that. Or why don't you come stop by the office or let's get in a call. Or that's what that elevator pitch is for. So if you do have the, <coughs> I actually had someone only once in my life, I was um, at Looker, the last company that I did, and we were on the fourth floor. So this is not a long elevator ride. Luckily, it was a slow elevator. And he goes, hey, I want to run something by you. And we happened to be getting on the elevator and went, went on those four floors. And it was purely designed to intrigue me or not. So that's what you do at a cocktail party is see someone who could help you, think to yourself, what can I say that will intrigue this person? Make them believe that this is an interesting idea, that has a reasonable size market, this is a new approach, and that this is the person who just might be able to solve that. And then if you're successful, they'll say, I can't talk about it now, I'm here with my wife, get away. But <laughs> listen, why don't, you, why don't you call me later? That's great. That's, that would be what you get out of it, saying, hey, can I get $10,000 from you? Here's my idea. Uh, I'm going to be turning over to the uh, cocktail Franks in about two seconds. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, so uh, you're, you're uh, talking about, you know, your, 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 uh, your marriage and your kids and, and that uh, and your life outside of business really hit a nerve in the chat. A lot of people are asking <laughs> how, how Mark, how do I strike a kind of balance like that to be able to chase what I want to do in business, but not have the rest of my life, you know, fall by the wayside. I'm thinking about the right way to answer that. Cause there's so many different ways uh, to approach it. I was not being glib when I said probably the thing that I'm proudest of was my ability to do that, which is to have a life and be successful as a business person, because it is really hard. And I, there's nothing I could say that would be able to convince you otherwise that it's not going to be really hard. Uh, it requires that you say this is a priority and that you mean it. Uh, and I, uh, and this is a story I've told a million times, so I'll give you the abbreviated version, but you can certainly find it in a bunch of places where I've been quoted online about it. But, you know, way back when, before Netflix, you know, uh, I had realized that I was getting way over, I was getting in too deep in the business thing. You know, I was staying, working every weekend, and I was staying late. Uh, I was, and I was thinking about it all the time. I wasn't in the office and not because I had some hard ass boss. I was just fascinated by it. I love what I was doing, 
But I realized I was living with this woman at the time, who's now my wife, and she was getting absolutely the short end of the stick here. And I realized this was not the basis of a sustainable relationship um, and committed to doing something different about it. And one of the things among many was saying that every Tuesday we're going to leave early. I'm going to leave work at five. We're going to have a date night, no matter what's happening, no matter how big the crisis is, no matter who needs to meet with me, I'm leaving. Um, and I stuck to that for years and years and years as a way of saying, I need to preserve this. But the amazing thing is so much of what we get caught up in as entrepreneurs is this feeling that we have to do everything. We have to review every word that appears on the website. We have to go through, sit there and go through the technical reviews and the code reviews. And we've really got to make sure that there's a million details and no wonder you work, uh, in 60 hours a week kind of thing. But the reality is, is that if you're really good at prioritizing, most of that stuff isn't going to make a difference. And you've got to be comfortable saying, I'm going to let a lot of stuff go. Things are going to go out that are not as good as the way I would have done them. And what you have to look back and say are the things that I'm letting go, the ones that if they're not perfect, doesn't make a difference. And the ones that I'm paying attention to are the ones that do have to be 110% right. And what that does is frees you up to be able to have the other things that are important in your life. And besides just, besides just your family and your wife or your partner or your kids, you've got to keep yourself healthy. I mean, listen, I'm dressed up like a pumpkin right now because I'm about to go out and do some skiing. But I've done that in my whole life. I have gone out to do backcountry skiing or mountain biking or canoeing or kayaking or surfing. And I've done that even while I was building these companies, even while I was keeping my marriage together. And I did that because I was extremely disciplined about prioritizing what was important and recognizing that I could let some stuff slide at work. And I've learned over time, it was not going to sink the boat. So the answer, you've got to make it a priority. Um, and I, if nothing else I can demonstrate is it's possible to have both. That's great. And a question that came in. So, so that's your personal life in, but what about your, the company culture? Like, how do you, how do you get that message out to people you're working with work who are working for you? Uh, and get them to strike that right balance too, because you don't want them to take advantage of you either. I'm guessing. Uh, so how do you how do you get that message out in a in a constructive way? So these these are such wonderful setup questions, uh, uh, Dan. I appreciate it. The uh, the as I've said many times, culture is observational, not aspirational. The culture doesn't come from what you want it to be. It does not come from what you publish as your culture manifesto or what you put, hang on the walls of the break room. Culture is how you act. And so you can talk until you're blue in the face. Oh, it's balance is important. We, this company, we really want everyone to have a life outside of work. And then if they see the boss who never leaves and who's sending text messages that 11 o'clock at night and on the weekend and getting people on conference calls on a holiday, that's basically saying one thing and doing another. And so kind of the miracle about those Tuesday night date nights was besides keeping my relationships strong, everyone else was going, Mark is not, he's not feeding us a line here. He's actually doing this. He's walking the walk. And it was really amazing because not only did crises stop happening after five o'clock on Tuesdays? And the people stop needing to talk to me after <laughs> five o'clock on Tuesdays. They all began realizing they could do these things and it worked. But I, have to, I got to throw in one last thing, Dan, which is that I and the rest of the team at the companies I've worked built a culture which supported that. And mm. not every company has that. And we were extremely diligent about making sure that people who worked there had the judgment to know how to do that, to say, I'm going to judge you not by how many hours you work, not by where you're working from. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm going to judge you based on what you get accomplished. And if you can get the things accomplished that we need to get accomplished by working two hours a day, four days a week, all power to you. I'm jealous. 
Um, but I, I, you can if you can do it working from the moon. Um, whatever. I'm jealous, but I'm judging you on that. And people then recognize there are ways to get the things done I have to get done, and have a life. That's great. I love that, and it could not agree more. Um, Mark often will email from a chairlift. He's uh, he's <laughs> always not, no, he does not. Um, so, uh, in less happy uh, w times, uh, so we got this question in from Chantel. How do you keep your sales and marketing teams motivated when things aren't going so swell? Um, you know, people feel not maybe it's not a sinking ship, but things aren't going great. How do you keep people at it and positive and energy? Yeah, that's really challenging. And I don't want to give people the impression, oh, just hold the flag up. No, it's 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 hard. And um it's a bummer. And I think part of it, at least for me, is differentiating between whether they're things that we're doing wrong or whether they're things that are just happening um, in the market that we have very, very little control of. Uh, and I think a big piece of it is setting realistic goals uh, and having the goals be far enough out that um, uh you can remain motivated to be marching toward them, even though the current conditions for marching are pretty poor. Uh, I I don't know how, to, how I can translate this, but I, I'll, I'll give you the personal version, is I generally don't get bummed out about stuff because even when things are really bad, they're so interesting. I mean, you right. learn... You learn, you learn more when things aren't going well than when they're going well. And that's genuinely true because when everything's going well, you're never quite sure what it is that's leading to the success. Is it things we're doing or is it the market's lifting all the boats? And even though we're, we're going slower than everyone else, we're still, you can't tell when things go to hell, you really begin to examine wow, what's going on? And to me as an entrepreneur, that's fascinating. And the reason I bring that up is that that attitude becomes contagious, is that mm. people begin recognizing that this is really, really cool. We're learning so much. And this is the most genuine thing I can say. I don't know how to get you through it, that it's depressing. I guarantee it, that feeling of, oh my gosh, we're in an existential crisis now. If we don't get this right, we're out of business. But when I look back, on my career as an entrepreneur at the times that felt most alive and the most exciting and that my teams all talk about 10 years later about what we remember about building a company together, we do not talk about the times it was going really well. The things we almost always talk about as being the coolest were when it was going really badly. So recognize it, appreciate it, and just think of the stories you're going to have. That's that's so great. and. If my kids are are watching this, uh, turn it turn it off for a minute. But yeah, it's like you think back to college. You don't remember the test that you prepared for and studied and did great. You you remember the thing that you forgot until four o'clock in the morning and banged it out and somehow passed. You know, like you remember those the the crisis and and pushing through it. So I think it's, that's great. Yeah, I refer to the fact that I do a lot of outdoor stuff. I do a lot of mount do a little less, less now, but I used to do a lot of mountaineering, and there are there's climbs that I remember, maybe they're three days, you know, you two bivvies on them. And I can't remember most of it. The times I remember are when the epics took place, when the right. things were crazy, difficult and scary and dark. And that's what I remember. And I remember it extremely fondly. So that, oh, what can I say? It, uh, you look back fondly. I promise. <laughs> I love that movie about you free soloing, free soloing uh, El Cap. That's, that's oh amazing. Um, <laughs> so uh, we got a we got a question in here from Larry who's saying, you know, when you don't have a lot of funds, but you kind of do need help, um, you know, do you have any ideas for how someone could maybe do like exchange services, or how do you kind of you know, I'll do this for you. You do that for me. How do you approach that that kind of thing? Well, there's there's 
two there's a bunch of things first of all a tremendous amount of people are willing to help you out if the problem that you're trying to solve is interesting you can convince them it's interesting and you let them do something interesting so you know don't ask don't get you know uh I'll probably regret saying this on a large scale podcast, but I mentor companies. You know, I have a handful of people that I spend a lot of time helping and I don't get paid for that. I do that because it's really interesting. I like the founders, like the problem. So the most important thing is there are a lot of people who will do that. Um, there are people who will exchange services. It would use something for them that is something for you. The other thing to think about is you said, quote unquote, we're short on funds. Well, uh, all companies, or most at least entrepreneurial companies, startups, have two sources of compensation. You have cash and you have equity. And the one you want to pay with is the one that's less dear to you. And, and listen, if you're at the beginning, when you have little or no money, well, you probably have 100% of the company. So give away some of it. Uh, don't fall in this trap of I need to jealously guard every single share that I have when being, op being open about that and bringing in some smart people who will do some consulting for you or some contracting for you or come on as a part-time employee or an employee that I can pay them largely or entirely in stock. It's another way to do it. And at some point in your entrepreneurial arc, when hopefully and um, likely you're very successful and all of a sudden fundraising isn't the problem. Yeah. Then it shifts. Then you go, I'm no, I, I'm extremely, when we hire people, we don't give them very much equity. We give them more cash. And that's the balance you're always looking at. So yes, you can do it. Be clever, be creative. Um, we got a, we got a question in uh, earlier today and we'll, we'll try to get a couple more in before we release Mark to the mountains. Um, have you ever been part of a rebrand? How how does that process go without kind of throwing away everything that you've done, but you know you need a pretty big change? So you answered your own question. You know you need a pretty big change. So what's, uh, what's stopping you? And the way to make yourself feel better about this, and it works not just for um, rebranding, it works for changing prices, it works for changing feature set, it works for changing terms, is that you got to recognize it's way more important to get it right for your next 10,000 customers than it is to protect your previous 1,000 customers. Uh, and I'm always thinking that way. It's different depending upon the type of business you have. If you have a business, let's say you're an uh, airline, you're an airplane manufacturer. Well, there just aren't that many customers. So you can't afford to piss them off by doing changing pricing randomly and re reneging on feature promises or whatever those things are. But if you're in a company where you go, we have a thousand people now and we think we're going to have 10,000 in the next two years and a hundred thousand after that, way more important to get it right for the future. So you just got to go ahead and do it. I mean, I am literally this morning talking about doing a very dramatic rebrand of a organize of something that i'm working on and it's going to mean a pretty big disruption but in my classic glasses half full uh, personality i'm going this is awesome because the people who stick with us who migrate to this new brand and are going to be the ones that i really want rather than trying to hold on to the people who are kind of only partially engaged. So have courage onward. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, you get Mark, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Uh, people are loving all this. And I want to thank everyone for all these awesome questions and all the interaction. I see some of you talking back and forth to each other in the chat, which is awesome. Um, Mark, I'm wondering if, uh, as we prepare to wrap this up, uh, maybe if you could send people out with a little homework. Uh, you know, we do these every couple of months, but maybe something people could kind of set their sights on in a in like a two month window. What's something that everyone could could put their mind to? Well, that's a good question, Dan. Uh, I, I would say because I know that the the scale of the businesses from everybody is very very different. You're all on different stages, different markets, so kind of hard to be generic. But I would say 
almost all using this last branding question as an example, there's probably always something that you've wanted to try uh, that you know everyone's going to freak out about, whether that's the rest of my team, whether that's my customers. Uh, and I'm not doing it because I'm scared of the reaction. Uh, and I think some great homework is to say, how can I figure out a way to try this and see what happens and see whether all my fear is warranted? Because what I suspect will happen is exactly the same thing that happens when you have stage fright that happens when you have imposter syndrome. And that is that the imagined crises are always way, way more extreme than the real ones. So there you go. Take something that you've been a little bit scared to try because you're scared of the pushback or the damage or the whatever, and figure out some way to do it. That is awesome. I love it. Mark. Please tell us, besides checking out uh, Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch on Sling TV and entrepreneur.com slash TV, how can people keep up with you and hear even more of these great words from a great man? So one of the things I noticed, certainly, Dan, because I can see this, the scrolling of the comments on the right side of my screen here is that we've had probably a ratio of 50 to 1 of questions asked and questions answered. And I feel badly I'm not able to answer all of them. But I will point you to a few resources that might go a little further toward helping you out. One is obviously Entrepreneur. Besides Entrepreneur TV, they have a huge range of resources, all designed to help entrepreneurs. So make sure you check out what they have to offer. Number two if you come to markrandolph.com, you can find a way to find all the other ways that I spout nonsense, either whether it's on Twitter or on LinkedIn or on uh, Instagram and on, yes, on TikTok. Uh, and you can also read all my blog posts there or sign up to get them in your mailbox every Wednesday. And finally, uh, I'm actually engaged in uh, a big entrepreneurial community called Neverland, it consists of about 2,500 entrepreneurs, just like all of you. And I'm there almost every day answering questions. But more importantly, there's people from all over the world with all ranges of experience in all kinds of different domains um, who can help. And if you want to apply, it's a membership, it's an invitation only, but if you want to apply for membership, you can see the link right there on your screen and hope to see some of you there. And Dan, but thanks for the opportunity to at least answer a few questions, as many as we could. Oh man, we, we love it. We are so appreciative and everyone follow Mark on Instagram because he's heading out to the mountains. He'll be posting photos of him fighting a Yeti or, uh, you know, <laughs> doing whatever he does out there. <laughs> so uh, You can imagine that Dan, I think that's a good image for me. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks to everyone who showed up and for the great questions and we will see you again next time. See you all next time. And thanks again, Dan. Great job. Thank you.